this talk is actually not going to be about phase change memory at all. Uh, it just so happened that phase change memory is the first technology that uh, pushed us in this direction. It forced us to deeply rethink the interface to uh, storage. Uh, and uh, what I want you to take away uh, from this today is that I'm gonna show you a couple of uh, hacks, uh, like Tom said, clever uh, tricks that we played to uh, speed up this interface. But really this should inform discussion about what the next generation of uh, CPUs and buses ought to look like. Now, I've got the most awesome job in all of storage, right? What we do in our group, in our research group at HGST, and we are hiring, by the way, uh, is we sit around and we ponder these grand questions, such as what comes after a NAND flash? Okay. Now, I'll let that sink in for a second. So basically what I'm saying is that NAND flash is so successful, so spectacularly successful, that it's boring, right? So NAND flash is for revenues and not for research. So what we research is what's gonna come next? What are the upsets in this market that are going to displace this or something else? And so if you were paying attention on Tuesday morning, you heard that the next big thing in storage is DRAM. And so I'm gonna step on my soapbox right here and use up all my karma points to tell you that that's not gonna happen. And the reason that's not gonna happen is uh, if you see my uh, pointer is this kilowatt here, right? So basically the dirty secret of DRAM is to keep a terabyte of data alive in DRAM, you have to pump in about a kilowatt of electricity at all times. And this is if you don't intend to read or write to it, right? Uh, so, if you were to use spinning disk for this, it would take you about a watt for the same thing. And I'm going to walk you through a little mental calculation. Just so let's say that uh, you take all the amount of data that's in DRAM today, and that's about the same as what used to be on spinning disks about 15 years ago, right? Moore's law is your friend. Uh, so if you remember that at the time of last census, about 2.2 whatever, 3.2.6% of all the electricity generation in the United States was actually spent on data centers, which is essentially all spinning disk and the cooling of same. Then if you just wanted to um, bring all this data we have today on spinning disk into DRAM, you would have to up the uh, energy generation of the United States by about two orders of magnitude in the next 15 years. And good luck with that. Right? Now fear not, uh, your baby photos and your family videos are safe because there are all these hot new technologies that are going to replace uh, you know, NAND flash and disk drive and DRAM if you look at the, and you listen to the marketing folks. Uh, but in seriousness, what all these technologies have uh, in common, you've probably heard of uh, MRAM and the star STT MRAM, and then there's FE RAM and uh, resistive, whoops, resistive RAM and CB RAM, and there's this runt of the litter, the phase change me memory, which is not even a RAM. Uh, what they have in common is they're competing to become the uh, fundamental memory cell for something called a resistive readout cross point memory technology. Now the cross point thing has to do with how you stack these things in three dimensions and achieve high packing densities, and so that's not the point. The, the clincher of my argument here is this resistive readout. What resistive readout means is that you're pushing electrons to this device and you can settle your sense amplifier really quickly, meaning under 100 nanoseconds. So basically, uh, look at the picture that I'm painting for you here. All these new technologies that are just around the corner now are uh, going to be expensive, right? It takes a lot of money to develop these technologies and they're going to be fast. So none of these look like NAND flash to me, right? They look like exactly like DRAM. So basically the point is that uh, these new technologies like STTM RAM, for instance, if it's successful, is not going to displace NAND flash. It's going to displace DRAM because it's high cost and high speed. All right, so what about the space change memory that we're playing with? So like I said, in our group, we play with all these memories. We're agnostic to any given technology. Uh, but PCM is not new. Uh, it was actually invented uh, before I was born. It was invented by this fellow, Stanford Olshinsky. Um, and uh, he was uh, coincidentally a very prolific inventor and he also invented the battery in your Prius. So how do you write to PCM? Well, um, like you heard uh, on the first day, you basically send current pulses through it and depending on what kind of pulse you send, you write a one or a zero. And the point is that if you send a high current pulse, you melt the substrate and then it cools off into this amorphous semiconducting state. And if you heat it just above, uh, just sorry, below the melting temperature, then it tends to crystallize spontaneously very quickly. Uh, now, um, and then you get a crystalline state which has a low resistivity. Now remember the resistivity, right? So resistive readout results in really blazing fast read performance. So it's about 89 seconds for the current generation of NAND flash that you can buy with a credit card from Micron. Uh, now this melting really throws a wrench into the works. Uh, and the problem is that it takes hundreds of microseconds to write to it. Uh, so the writes are optimized, you typically write blocks, you never write single bits, although you could modify single bits in this memory. And for instance, a one kilobyte block at a current generation of dies at 45 nanometers takes about 130 microseconds. So of course, you know, we're thinking, well, this is gonna kill DRAM. Uh, and our first impulse was let's make a main memory out of it. Let's attach it to the CPU main bus. And uh, this 130 microseconds really uh, ruins your entire day. Uh, because if your cache line eviction takes 130 microseconds, then everything will slow down by about an order of magnitude, and that's the best case, right? 
So, okay, plan B, what do we do? Well, let's make a peripheral storage device out of it. And we know how to do that. We ship about 10 million of those per year. Um, so, uh, NAND flash kind of went through the similar growing pains initially. If you remember the, all the flash drives that used to be sold would attach to a host bus adapter or SATA. And then as NAND flash technology improved, it exceeded uh, the bandwidths of SATA and the latencies were too long and then it moved slowly to PCI Express. And initially, uh, these PCI Express protocols were secret, right? they were proprietary, and then some smart folks got together and said, well, why don't we define a standard protocol? And uh, what resulted was called the NVM Express, NVMe. You can download a spec, it's all open. Um, and NVMe is a protocol just like for disk drives, SATA used to be, but now for non-volatile memory-based devices that are attached to PCI Express. Right? And uh, I'm going to spend roughly the next 10 minutes of my talk on this one timing diagram. Right? This is the crux of my talk. Uh, so what I'm going to show you is how one small random read operation happens over NVMe. Right? We, we thought this was a good starting point for our device. We put some PCM memory on a, a PCI Express card, stick it in, stuck in a computer, and the question was how to read from it. So let's show off this awesome 80 nanosecond latency. Uh, well, uh, the, the point of NVM Express, just like all the other protocols of yore, is that uh, here, this is a corner of a diagram that I took from the MUE spec, right? You have the host in the upper corner, the, the blue uh, rectangle, and you have the peripheral here. And then uh, you see two queues. So these queues are shown as uh, inside the core. This is really not a well, very informative diagram. So these queues really belong to a core, but they don't sit inside the core. Uh, they're really queues in host DRAM. Uh, but because of the caching um, uh, in modern CPUs, they really, there's about two to four copies of them. Anyway, but one is that you want to uh, send requests to this device. The device is sitting idle there waiting for you to command it from the CPU. And you have a submission queue and a completion queue. Right? So basically, uh, you take your um, core N, puts a command in a submission queue, it somehow gets to the device, and then your completion comes back and your data is ready. Right? Now, like I said, this diagram is not very informative, so what I've done is I've done a little bit more informative timing diagram here so that you understand exactly what's happening at a very low level. Uh, so we have three players. Uh, we have the CPU here, we have DRAM, the host DRAM, and we have uh, our peripheral uh, device attached via this PCI Express uh, slow link. I'm gonna call it a slow link. You'll understand why in a second. So you have a thread running on your CPU, and uh, your thread basically has to build up that command. Right? You don't just send the command. So what you do is you talk to the host DRAM, and you put some stuff in there saying, okay, this is my small read command. It tells where to read from, where to read to. It may carry some security information, yada, yada. So once this is done, you send a packet across PCI Express from the CPU. This is what's called a PIO in the, in the parlance for the connoisseurs of PCIe. And this packet is called a doorbell. So the doorbell basically tells the device that there's a new command in the queue and go and fetch it and do something, whatever is said in the command. So then the device sends out a DMA request to host DRAM without involving the CPU, fetching the command. Then this DMA response arrives and at this point you know what to do with PCM. And herein lies our problem, right? From this point to this point where you know what to do with PCM, it's about uh, well over a microsecond. Now, if on the other hand, you, uh, on the other uh, side of the link, you have flash uh, memory as your medium, then that's not a big deal because flash read is gonna take 70 microseconds anyway, so this extra microsecond is uh, a drop in the bucket. But now with PCM, uh, we have 100 nanosecond latency. We have 80 nanosecond latency for, to read the data and about 150 nanoseconds until all the data is in our memory controller. So now this becomes huge, it's a drag, right? We basically slow down our wonderful new uh, technology by an order of magnitude. And uh, I'm gonna talk about this second part later. <clears throat> so we sat down and we looked at this and we, we saw that we have two choices, right? One is we can redesign the CPU, we can redesign the bus. But that's kind of uh, extreme. So what can we do with PCIe today? Can we make a peripheral that is meaningful uh, in the market today? So the question we asked was basically what can we remove? Let's take everything to the chopping block that's not absolutely necessary to make this protocol work. Okay? So the first thing, let's talk about these doorbells. What is a doorbell? So a doorbell uh, is, in NVMe, it's eight bytes, but basically the amount of information that you, you communicate across the link with the doorbell is exactly one bit normally. You just tell the device, hey, there's a new command in the queue, so the head of the queue has advanced by one. Now on PCI Express, this one bit of communication uh, incurs a humongous penalty, right? The penalty is you actually have to send about 24 or 28 bytes of overhead, and then another 300 or so nanoseconds of latency, which is another half a kilobytes worth of data transfer that you have to wait there just for the doorbell to arrive before you can even go and fetch the command. And we decide, okay, let's just eliminate this entirely. 
Now, the first question that everybody asks, why can't you just send a command from the CPU? And the answer to that question is really long and involved, and I'm not going to get into the details here, uh, but it boils down to legacy. Right? Back in the day when CPUs had no cache on them, there was this clear distinction between uh, memory accesses and I.O. accesses, and essentially there's, there was no way to do a bulk transfer from a CPU out to PCIe. Now, this is not true anymore. Right? You have 47 megabytes of level 3 cache on the newest Intels. So in principle, you could just dump all that out to PCIe, but that's not how it's done. Right? So we're kind of stuck with this. Um, so we said, OK, we're going to uh, stay with this idea that we have a queue in host memory. But now, instead of having the doorbells, I mean, keep in mind that this is the most expensive memory in the system. right? So it would behoove you to keep it busy. So we're going to optimize for this case when there's always a new command in the queue. You just keep the queue full all the time. So in that case, well, we might as well pull the queue all the time. Right? So one thing we did was we basically uh, wrote an FPGA core that uh, just goes and pulls the queue in host memory all the time without waiting for initiation from the host. Okay, so what about, uh, oh, and then the question is how do you synchronize the queues, right? Of course, synchronization is actually pretty easy. There are many schemes and the simplest one is called the phase bit. Uh, it means that you just need to synchronize the knowledge of where the queue is at the beginning and then you have this bit that you keep flipping as you make your cycles through the queue. And then uh, the transition from zero to one means tail and one to zero means head. So that's not a big problem. All right, what about this other part that I didn't even touch, the completion signal and the interrupt? Uh, well, the interrupt is a big hot mess, right? The interrupt we want to avoid at all costs because, for instance, on the fastest CPU money can buy, if you're running Linux today, it, for two context switches, which means that you go to sleep and you get woken up by the interrupt, it takes about one and a half microseconds or so. Again, an order of magnitude worse than our memory that we are trying to show off here. So let's nix that. So uh, what you can do then is you can pull on this completion signal. But we went, we went one step further. We said, can we eliminate the completion signaling entirely? Right? Is there any way to figure out the completion without having the completion queue? And the answer is yes. Uh, and I'm going to show you how. Uh, the gist of it is that you basically pull on the data, because you keep in mind we're doing reads here. Reads are the fast operation. So before you start your read, you know exactly where your data is going to come. So if you look for this last packet to arrive, in the buffer in which it's going to arrive, then you know it's there. Now, this is greatly complicated by the fact that PCI Express is actually not a bus, it's a network. And um, a network allows out of order reception of packets. So in other words, uh, if you have, for instance, this packet hit a bump and explodes, then the endpoint is going to resend it and it may arrive at who knows when. And so if you just look at the last packet, you can get data corruption. Now, this actually doesn't happen often in practice. It's very rare, uh, but you have to account for it. Right? So how do we do this thing? Um, so this is what we call the uh, Atlas or the completion list. This is the C in DC Express. Uh, basically, we take advantage of the fact that the link to DRAM is uh, almost two orders of magnitude faster than the PCIe on our system. And um, you might say, well, PCIe is going to get faster. And that's true, but also DRAM is getting faster. And you know, if you think about hybrid memory cube, you're going to get to something like three terabits per second to DRAM versus a piddly 50 gigabits to, to PCI Express. So uh, it costs us almost nothing to write things into DRAM before we send the read command. Right? So what we do is we'll choose this, what's called the incomplete tag. So we pick a pattern, any pattern, and we just write it at the end of each chunk of DRAM where these packets are going to settle eventually. Right? So now we have an inverse protocol. Essentially, instead of waiting for the data to arrive, we wait for this thing that we wrote to disappear. Right? We send the command, and then eventually these values, A, B, C, D, E, F, and so on, are going to come from the storage device across the link. They're going to settle. And then uh, we pull on the last one when we see it disappear and we know it's done, but then we have to go back and check. And if we still see this in some uh, packet space, it means the packet hasn't arrived. So this is a way to um, save that extra bit that you have to send over PCI Express, which results in another packet of 28 bytes. Right? Now, uh, there's a bit of discussion. Uh, I have uh, five minutes, so I'm just going to briefly skim over how do you choose the value of this. Uh, obviously, one problem is that if your uh, value that's stored in the storage device is exactly the same as what you chose your zero incomplete tag, then you're going to have a collision on the protocol, right? You're going to basically be sitting there waiting for your data to arrive and not noticing it arriving. Uh, so there are ways that we discussed and they're mentioned in the paper of how you can have basically, keep in mind that on like a network protocol, we are actually privy here. This is a storage device, so we're privy to all the data that's coming into it over time. So in principle, we can dedicate some computing resources on the device to keep track of all these ends of packets and uh, communicate back to the host something that for sure cannot ever uh, appear. Uh, however, as we thought about this deeper, we realized that this is probably only relevant for a very tiny fraction of all our uh, customers, and namely those are the hard real-time latency bound 
um, things like you know your car systems or whatever. Uh, but for the vast majority of operating systems like Linux and Windows, you really don't care if you occasionally get a latency spike. And since the reads from PCM are deterministic, you essentially take the time that it takes to read, you multiply it by the queue depth, and this is the maximum latency you can ever expect to see. So when you send your read command out, if nothing comes back in that time, you simply time it out, you pick a new tag at random, and you continue. Right? Now, uh, the point of this little calculation here is that, uh, obviously, uh, you can always make this probability of collision arbitrarily low by choosing a bigger tag. Right? Because there's only so many things that can be stored at any one time on a device. It's limited by the capacity of the device. So um, there's a little discussion of uh, how low you can make those. All right, so what are we left with? Uh, we're left with a protocol that we call DC Express, means doorbell less, completion less. Right? We have nothing left. We're polling the memory, we're ping-ponging our commands through DRAM from both ends. Right? We're polling the DRAM from the endpoint, and we're polling the completions from the host. So there's no completion queue. Uh, and we just keep doing this, whether the device is idle or not. How does this work? It works wonderfully. Uh, well, compared to the alternatives, right? Uh, so what I've shown here is we come from the disk drive world, so our IOP is 512 bytes, and I apologize for that, but uh, let's go with that. Uh, so for, at 512 bytes, we can get about 700,000 IOPs at QDEPTH 1. Now, for comparison with a flash SSD, a PCIe SSD, you can get about 13,000 IOPs, and that's limited by flash itself, not by the protocol, right? So this is good. Now, it's really important to distinguish here um, latency from bandwidth, right? The green stuff is bandwidth. This is how much time it actually takes to transfer those bits uh, across PCIe. And uh, the Gen 2 by 4 is just what we had lying around on the bench. Uh, but in principle, today, if you bought a motherboard at Fry's and you went and uh, built a card with the latest generation, everything, and went to Gen 3 by 16, then uh, you would roughly get about this bandwidth uh, with the 4K packets, right? Now, this blue part, unfortunately, it won't shrink. On PCIe, uh, you're stuck with uh, almost a microsecond of protocol latency. This blue part includes um, polling from both ends and parsing the commands and so on. And this red part is just a little piece that PCM uh, contributes. So you see that uh, even with our uh, clever tricks, we're still almost an order of magnitude worse on the protocol than on the PCM. Uh, so this is what we would like to see change, right? In the future generation of CPUs, uh, in buses, we would like to see uh, the, either these kinds of schemes or some other kinds of schemes with different sleep states incorporated so that we can um, uh, fix this in a more fundamental way. But this is what you can do today. All right, so let me summarize. I'm almost out of time. Uh, so it is possible to use uh, PCI Express for in-context bulk reads, and uh, the round-trip latency to user process uh, in our hands is about 1.4 microseconds, and this is uh, running on the bench right now. It's not a simulation. Uh, and uh, this basically makes it unnecessary to do context switching because context switching is even more expensive than this. Uh, we found ways to eliminate doorbells and completions, and completion is a bit more complicated, and this scheme for eliminating completions and deducing completion from the data is actually probably more generally applicable uh, in the sense that whenever you're doing a ping pong uh, of a memory through two links that are of vastly different la latencies, you can always use the fast link to pre-populate the buffers and then the slow link can, has to send less data. And finally, perhaps more controversial, the phase change memory has arrived. You can buy it now. It is pretty good, and uh, I hope we've shown you the way to use it in, uh, in a way that's not uh, totally bad. Right? So with that, uh, thank you very much, and I'll open for questions. Hi, Brad Mori, HP Lab. So I like this, it's cool. Uh, the obvious question, it seems, is why didn't you put it on the DRAM bus? Because the latency there is, you, you can take advantage of the performance of PCM there. Right, uh, that, that, that is the first thing you would want to do. Uh, and we'll do that as soon as DDR incorporates the notion of queues, right? Because you can't evict without waiting for the thing to finish. So if you had to wait 130 microseconds for your cache line eviction, uh, basically, everything slows down, right? Your, your attack kernel is trivial. You just need to write a little bit more than the cache, and then you, everything stops on the CPU. So, so you essentially have to add DRAM in between as a level four cache, so to speak, right, where you stage your writes. Mm -hmm. that's, that's basically what you do, right? So. Uh, you could do that for sure, yeah. yeah. And then you get all the benefits of having the, on that side, the, you know, the performance of it being on that side of the bus, and you don't have to do all the tricks that you, this um, is cool, don't get me wrong, but it yeah, seems like it's really it's, a huge overhead you're paying. Uh, 
Uh, it's a huge overhead. Well, you know, uh, if you have hybrid solutions, they tend to cost a lot, and you're stealing slots from other things, right? You have four DRAM sticks, you stick in four sticks of DRAM, you have DRAM, and it works really well with the memory controller, it's optimized for that. Sure. Uh, next generation or next, next, next generation Intel may have uh, a memory controller that knows how to deal with these asymmetric memories like NOR flash and PCM, right? nice. in which case you'd put it there. But right now, you really don't get that much benefit over uh, doing PCIe like this in a high load environment, which is your server server web pages, for instance, is pretty hot right now. Um, so to build a PCI Express card and ship it as a peripheral uh, for us is much, much easier than trying to stick this much memory onto a little dim stick. Right? Cool. And keep in mind that writes on PCM are power limited, right? So you probably want that extra connector to your card, like I a see. graphics card. Right? <laughs> So it's just economics, right? There's nothing wrong with your suggestion. In fact, that's how we started. We, the first thing we built was a dim stick. Uh, it wasn't clear what to do with it, though. Cool. Thank you. Uh -huh. Peter Desnoyers, Northeastern. Uh, since Brad scooped my question, uh, I'll ask uh, what, you know, if you were to say, uh, I mean, this is really an architecture question, but if you had a choice in which way PCI would evolve or could do PCIe over, what do you think would give better perform, do you know of anything that would give better performance for this type of low latency application? Yeah, so let me uh, give you a plug for a hybrid memory cube consortium right here, right? HMC is just like PCIe, but done, right, what they say. Uh, it is a much more improved uh, protocol for specifically for addressing memory over a serial interface. Uh, one of the problems with PCIe that is sort of fundamental is that you can't unbundle those lanes, right? If you go to entry by 16, you have to wait for all 16 to arrive, and that adds to your latency because you have to do a lot of churn in your um, endpoint to, to, re to, to you know, repack this packet and show it on some sort of parallel uh, interface. So with HMC, you have separate lanes. You have this concept of vaults, so each lane talks to its own vault. Uh, that's a natural fit for all these cross-point uh, future memories. Yeah, but Thank for sure, I mean, we can design you know, even even different one. Uh, it's not clear. Uh, HMC is really meant for devices soldered onto motherboards. Um, so there may be a connector in the future. We don't know. Okay. Thank you. Um, hi, Ted Cho from Google. Uh, so I understand that this is going to be expensive stuff. So you really want to try to keep it in use all the time. Uh, but did you take a look at what the power? Uh, impacts are of this constant polling across the PCIe Express bus if, you know, for example, we're not actually using um, the card at the time? Yes, yeah, so you'll see that in the paper, it's actually measured and shown. It's very low. It's like 6% and that's if you poll all the time. You don't have to poll all the time, right? It, it makes sense to poll faster than you would ever get with NVM Express, for instance, in which case it's even less. Um, but also keep in mind that this is 6% compared to the idle consumption of the server, which means that this uh, other 94 is refreshing DRAM, running the fans, and so on, right? So if you load that server, it's going to be even more negligible. Thank you. Thank our speakers.